Really interesting stuff there from Joe Rexode, columnist at The Athletic. I think the bottom line is the, with this is college athletics not going to change in any wholesale fashion. But this is going to allow athletes with real value to get something beyond what their scholarship currently entails. Now, here's the thing, and this maybe isn't talked about enough. Most athletes on scholarship at universities, Division I universities, even playing big-time sports, football or men's basketball, I think probably don't bring the value back to the university that the university spends on them in giving them a free education, in giving them world-class facilities, in giving them world-class training and nutrition and study help and all that stuff. I mean, at just about every Division I school, a four-year scholarship, you're talking about $100,000. Maybe much, much more than that if you're talking about a Vanderbilt or a place like that. And then you throw in all the extra stuff. How many athletes have that value back to the university? Not many. I mean, maybe the team as a whole does. So you have to have somebody out there. But the fact that it is actually Joe Smith doesn't mean anything more than if it was Jimmy Joe. And so the value that these athletes bring, there's very few that bring much more than that. But this will allow those who do to cash in on that. And I think that is completely, completely acceptable. As a matter of fact, something I've wanted to have happen for a long time. I just think it's capitalism. As long as the NCAA can figure out how to work all this into a way that they can somehow police it. Because I do get a little concerned if it starts getting into the recruiting deal. You haven't done anything yet, but we're going to give you this deal because we really want you to come to X school. And we really don't want you to go to our rival. That gets a little bit concerning to me. The other thing that I think will be fascinating here is what it does to competitive balance because there's people out there who have kind of painted that doomsday scenario again that this is just going to mean that Alabama and Ohio State and USC and Texas get all the biggest recruits Again, because they've got the most money. They're the biggest programs. They're the richest programs. They're the most historical programs. So they're just going to get the big recruits. Well, one, how is that not the case now? I mean, you look at the schools that get the big recruits. They're the same year in and year out. So, one, how is that different? But, two, I actually think there's an argument to be made that it may make it a little different. You know, right now, if you're a great player but maybe wouldn't play right away at Alabama, you still might go there. Because ultimately, they, they groom you to potentially make it to the NFL, arguably as well as anybody or better than anybody else out there. So you wait your turn and you get that grooming and maybe you get to the, your ultimate dream where you can really make a lot of money. You're probably going to win a national championship while you're there. And there is no extra benefit here. But if you could go someplace else, let's say, as opposed to being the second string linebacker and not playing a whole lot at Alabama, but you could go be the star linebacker from day one and play at Arkansas or Illinois or Colorado, would you? Would that be worth something under the new system? I mean, that's the thing. All these places have boosters and have in a lot of places, fairly small towns that probably have people who find it interesting to attach themselves somehow to the football program. And Alabama or Tuscaloosa or Columbus only have so many of those places. But a uh, Iowa City or a Minneapolis or a Madison, they also have those places. So maybe a few of those guys going to Ohio State before or Michigan before might now go to Wisconsin or Minnesota. Maybe it makes it e better. Maybe it makes it easier. All right, back to the phones. We got sneak in Ronnie here. Ronnie, thanks for the call. Hello. Yeah, Ronnie, you're on the air. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I think you kind of straddled the fence on this thing. Uh, idea here of what's going on because uh, there's one coach you're leaving out that said this uh, 
four or five years ago, or maybe longer, Steve Spurrier said, you go out to start playing and paying these people because they can't get their families to the game. And like the Titans and a lot of these other organizations, they're getting players off of these uh, unknown schools to people never heard of. It really don't make a difference uh, who's getting the scholarships or where they are because they're reaching out to the best player off of that off of that roadmap. Now, what I see now that these players are poverty players. They come out of poverty, and a lot of them put money back in the schools. A lot of them give them schools recognition, like MTSU and these other schools. Black Titans got the, a player off of there. But see, you don't give them credit for that. But it come a time when you want to split the money up. Because if you're getting a coach like uh, Nick Saban, seven, eight million dollars a year, and he ain't broke one bone on the field, these players could get hurt one play and their careers are finished. But y'all don't give them credit for it. Uh, you don't think about things in that analysis. You just want the uh, publicity and sports drama. But these players have been injured in some of these plays. There's no fault to their own. Just trying to overreact and do things to get a recognition. Or trying to help the players get name recognition. But I think these players deserve some kind of accolade for coming in there, dropping off everything they're doing, and put everything in these sports uh, to make themselves available, uh, to change their way of life. And nobody's getting them credit for it. All right, Ronnie, I appreciate that. Good stuff. we got to take a break. I'll come back. I'll answer that in our next segment.